Hello, everyone. My name is Ariella Wagner. I'm the founder of Sunray Construction Solutions, a national software and research company. We help thousands of subcontractors and suppliers secure their lien and bond claim rights. Today, we have another fabulous webinar. Today's topic is how do I get paid after I make a payment bond claim? Without further ado, I would like to introduce Alex Barthet, a board certified construction attorney. Thank you, Ariella. Uh, as she said, my name is Alex Barthet. I practice here in Florida, uh, and our practice focuses exclusively on construction matters, and most of that is collections. And today, I'm going to tell you about uh, the steps that you need to take in order to secure your bond rights. And then once you do that, what do you need to do so you can actually get paid? Um, so today's agenda uh, specifically is um, we'll talk about what a payment bond claim is and how it differs from a lien claim. We'll talk about the deadlines that apply to payment bond claims. I'll talk to you uh, and show you uh, and give you a handout for uh, the new notice of non-payment form, which goes into effect October 1st, uh, so just about a week away. Um, and then I'll tell you the steps that you need to follow uh, and why you need to follow those steps so that you can actually turn your bond claim into money. Um, and then we'll answer any questions at the end. With respect to the questions, uh, go ahead and use the GoToWebinar chat box uh, and submit your questions throughout the presentation and we will answer them all at the end. Please do not include any names of people or companies in your question, um, but go ahead and ask them because uh, we'll, we'll take care of all of them at the very end. So let's get started. So what is a payment bond claim? Uh, a payment bond secures your right to be paid on a construction project in lieu of a lien. As you know, you can lien a property. Uh, so if you don't get paid, you put an encumbrance on the property equal to the value that you've improved the property. So let's say you're a material supplier and you deliver $50,000 worth of electrical fixtures um, that get incorporated into the project. If you're not paid, then you could put a lien on the property and sell the property and you would be entitled to recover from the equity of the property the amount that you're owed. That's the concept of a lien. But there are instances in which one, you may not have lien rights or two, the owner has taken steps to exempt the property from liens. Um, and in both of those instances, you'll have a right against a payment bond. Um, so for example, public projects, if you were to do work at a school, a public school, you don't have a, a lien right in public property. So that job is gonna be bonded. And that payment bond uh, is where you're going to get your security um, on a condominium or uh, a big commercial project. The owner may require the contractor to uh, get a payment bond on that project. So then your recovery is not against the property. It's against that payment bond. Um, how do you know if the job is bonded? If you pull the notice of commencement, which again, should be recorded in the public record in the county where the project is located, or a copy is supposed to be on the job site uh, posted with the permit. It should make reference to the bond company. So there's a little line that says surety, and maybe it says Hartford or Travelers or Continental. That's how you know the job is bonded. Now, if you use Sunray to do your notices, they do all of that research for you, and they make sure that that surety gets a copy of the first and second notice, which we're going to talk about next. Um, so let's talk about the deadlines that you need to follow to make sure that you secure your uh, right to get paid on a payment bond claim. So let's break these down into two big categories. Category number one is you're working on a private project and that project has a payment bond on it. So let's run through the timeframes for this scenario because they're slightly different for a public project, which we'll talk about next. So the general rule is, if you have a direct contract with the bonded prime contractor, so that means the owner hires a general contractor who posts a bond, you're the plumber, so you have a direct contract with the uh, bonded contractor, 
you do not need to send that first notice. So that notice to owner, notice to contractor, um, you don't need to send it. It's not required under the statute. That being said, I strongly encourage you to send uh, a notice in that situation. Um, our advice to our clients is you should have a process in your office that any job over a certain amount gets bonded. Maybe it's $500, maybe it's $2,500, maybe it's $5,000. Whatever you decide, you make it a habit that no matter what, you're gonna notice those jobs. Where we see clients make mistakes is where the rules will sometimes require notice and others not, this is an example, and they try to, okay, well, we don't need to send a notice here, so we won't, and invariably they make a mistake, and the mistake that they make is on the job that needed a notice, um, and they didn't send one, and then they lose their lien rights. So I encourage you, pick a, a dollar amount in your office, every job over that amount, you're gonna notice no matter what. So, um, you, while you don't need to send that first notice, the notice to owner, you should send it and it needs to be received by the surety and the contractor no later than 45 days from your first work. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. The next notice if you um, that you need to send is the notice of non-payment. That needs to be sent within 90 days of your last work or delivery of materials to the project. Um, you need to file a lawsuit on the payment bond within one year from your last work or delivery of materials. Um, those are the primary rules that you need to be aware of. So if you do not have a direct contract with the bonded contractor, so let's assume you're a sub subcontractor or a supplier to a subcontractor, you need to serve the notice to owner, notice to contractor within 45 days of your first delivery of materials to the project or work on the project. This is the latest date it needs to be in the hands of both the contractor and the surety. You should not be waiting this long at all. If you use Sunray, there's a special rule that says that if you get it to them early and they bring it to the mail uh, to the post office by the 40th day from your first work, it's deemed delivered whether it actually gets there or not. So that's a, that's a, a very important reason why you want to do it early. You cannot do it any earlier than when you have the contract, but you can't do it any later than having it in the hands of the contractor and the surety by the 45th day. Remember, it takes several days of mail to get it to them via certified mail, so you want to do it early. The next step is the notice of non-payment needs to be served on the contractor and the surety no later than 90 days from your last work uh, on the project or delivery of materials to the project. Remembering that last work does not include punch list work and it doesn't include warranty work. So if you're the electrician and you go back, um, you finished all your contract work, you did all your change order work, and they call you back a week after that to uh, fix something that wasn't working, um, then your last state of work isn't isn't the last day you went back. It was the week before when you finished the actual contract or change order work. And then you need to file suit within one year from your last date of delivery of materials or work on the job. Now, if you are a sub contract, sorry, a sub subcontractor or a material supplier to a sub contractor, sometimes the contractor requires the subcontractor to get a bond. Um, that subcontractor bond is not recorded in the public records. So the way you need to be aware that it may exist and the way you get it is you make a request in writing to the contractor to, to see if the subcontractor has a bond. So let's take an example. Owner hires contractor, that contractor gets a bond. That bond is in the public record. But maybe it's a very big job and they decide, you know what, we're going to get the roofer to post a bond as well. So the roofer gives a bond, a payment bond as well. That bond gets handed to the contractor and a copy to the owner, but it's never recorded. But you, if you're the supplier to the roofer, you may have a claim if you're not paid against both the roofer's payment bond 
and the contractor's payment bond. But you need to get a copy of that roofer's uh, payment bond. And the way you do it is you make a request to the contractor to send you a copy. So let's talk about public projects and, and how the rules are a little different. So if you have a contract with a bonded prime contractor, so let's say the, the school board hires the contractor who hires you and you're the electrician, um, you do not need to send a notice to owner, notice to contractor. Again, this is the first notice, the one that normally needs to be sent within 45 days. Again, I strongly encourage you to do it no matter what. Um, you also, and this is a surprise to many people, do not need to send the notice of non-payment. But again, I strongly encourage that you do. Um, so if you are the electrician to the bonded contractor on a public job, you don't need to send the first notice. You don't need to send the second notice, the notice of non-payment. Your only requirement is that you need to file suit within one year from your last work or last delivery of materials to the job site. Again, I strongly encourage you, send that first notice to owner, still send the notice of non-payment. So if you are further down the chain, let's say you're a sub subcontractor, now you need to send both notices. So um, you need to send that first notice Notice to owner, notice to contractor within 45 days of your first work. The same rule applies. The 45 days is the outside deadline. If you get it to Sunray early, they'll, they'll bring it to the post office by the 40th day. They'll have the manifest stamped by the post office, and then it's automatically deemed delivered, even if it never gets there because maybe the post office made a mistake. Um, but again, that requires that you do it early. You need to serve the notice of non-payment within 90 days of your last work or last delivery of materials. You need to file suit within one year. I know I'm starting to sound like a broken record. The rules are rather repetitive. Um, and as I described before, if you're even further down the chain, maybe a supplier to a subcontractor or a sub-subcontractor, the subcontractor, the roofer, the electrician, the plumber, they may have their own bond, which you should try to get a copy of by making a written request to the contractor for the subcontractor's bond. There are a lot of deadlines, a lot of dates. We have an app for that. Um, if you go to the App Store or the Google Play Store and you search for The Lean Zone, L-I-E-N-Z-O-N-E, -E, you'll get our calculine and it will calculate all of the dates for you from first work to last work for both um, notice to owners um, as well as lean and bond claims. So let's talk about this new form that I mentioned, effective October 1st, 2019. You now need to use this new form um, of the notice of non-payment. The old form was like a letter. It just said, I did work on a project. Here's how much I'm owed. Um, the new form has a lot more detail. It looks more like a claim of lien and it needs to be notarized. So let's step through each of them. I'll show it, show you the form. And if in the go to webinar uh, box, you click on handouts, you'll see it there. You can download it in Word format um, and know that um, if you use Sunray, all of their forms are updated as the statutes change. So effective October 1st uh, in the Sunray system, the new form will automatically be there. So the biggest change is now this form must be uh, under oath. You need to notarize this form. It needs to include, as of the date of the notice, the following information. The nature of labor services performed or to be performed in the future, the materials furnished or to be furnished, the amount paid on the account as of the date of the notice, the amount owed as of the date of the notice, and the amount to become due if you know. Um, that would typically be the uncompleted portion of the uh, contract at that point when you serve that notice. Uh, it could be zero, it could be $100,000. Um, it also requires that you include the amount of retainage that is owed at that point in time uh, on the job. So if 
you're owed a hundred thousand dollars, fifty thousand of which is retainage, then you need to put that in the notice. Um, and here is the form. So it looks a lot more like the lien. Uh, it gets served, doesn't get recorded, served on the contractor and the surety. Um, and it has all of these blanks. And again, you can download this form right from the GoToWebinar box. Just click on Handouts. It's right there for you. Um, and, and again, probably the single most significant change is that now it has to be notarized um, before it's served. So how to get paid after making a bond claim. The first thing you have to remember is uh, that the notice of non-payment only starts the process. Um, just like a lien doesn't automatically mean you get paid because you'd have to sue someone to foreclose on the property, the notice of non-payment is the same way. Now you've given the contractor and the surety notice that you're owed money. It's, it's step one of the process. Many folks believe that, well, I serve my notice of non-payment and I automatically get paid. It's like an insurance claim. It isn't. Um, the, what you'll typically receive once you serve a notice of non-payment is a letter from the surety and it says, thank you for your claim. Uh, please fill out this proof of claim form and send it back with the backup information. You are more than welcome to do that uh, if, if you believe that that's going to get you paid. Um, but understand that in almost every situation, there's no obligation under Florida law to provide that proof of claim. And in many instances, but not every instance, but in many instances when clients come to us, um, we tell them there's no need to provide that proof of claim. And it rarely gets you paid just by submitting it. Um, and let me explain why. Uh, most sureties do not voluntarily pay you unless the principal, the contractor, him or herself, agrees to pay you first. And the reason why is the, is the relationship that exists for surety bond. Surety is not insurance. It is a credit instrument. So when the surety writes you a check for your claim, they look to the contractor and they say, okay, general contractor, we had to pay the roofer $50,000 on this bond claim. We want you now to pay us the $50,000 back. So while there's a bond premium that's paid, they also look to get made whole. So when you get in a car accident, um, and your insurance company writes you a check for $10,000, they don't come back to you and say, okay, now give us back the $10,000. Your premiums may go up, but it's not an indemnity product. You don't have to reimburse the, the insurance company. That's not the way it works with sureties. Sureties look to be made whole from their principal, whoever got the bond. So when they pay you, the, when the surety pays you, they want their money back from the principal. Because of that relationship and that, that tension, most sureties don't pay claims until the principal agrees to pay the claim or the principal may be out of business. Um, so that's why the mere submission of a claim to a surety doesn't automatically mean that you get paid. Sometimes sureties can shorten, uh, contractors and sureties can shorten the claim, uh, the time to file the lawsuit. Remember, I told you that's one year from your last work on the project. So you'll get a notice in the mail um, or a lawsuit shortening the time. Be very aware of those notices because once that period is shortened, um, usually it's either shortened to 60 days. That's what you'll get in the mail. Or it could be shortened to 20 days if you get served with a lawsuit. You have to be very careful because if you don't timely respond to those claims by filing your own lawsuit, you will lose your claim against the payment bond. Also watch out for a surety waiting you out, waiting the one year. We had a client who was owed about $100,000. She submitted a claim to the surety. She engaged with them back and forth over, you know, every month or two, they would ask for more information. She would submit it. Another two months would go by. She would say, hey, what's going on? They would respond, well, we're still investigating. And then one year and give or take a month after the last work on the project by our client. The surety sent a letter and said, we've reviewed your claim, we've denied it because now it is time barred. Because remember, I told you that you have to file a lawsuit 
on your claim within one year of your last work. She was thinking that this back and forth was producing results and, and may get her paid. In fact, they were just waiting her out, the year passed, and then they denied the claim, and she would be she was without recourse. So be very careful, and we're gonna talk a minute about why the steps you should take and when you should take them so that that doesn't happen to you. Um, I call it the 60-60 rule. That's what you should practice. At about day 60 from your last work on the job, that's when you should be starting to think about and prepare your notice of non-payment. Don't wait till day 70 or 80 or 88 because it takes time to prepare the notice, uh, fill in the information, notarize it, send it via certified mail. All that takes time. You should be starting that process at about day 60 from your last work on the job. Then for the next 60 days, you should hassle your customer, the surety, sending letters, um, emails, making phone calls. You need to be a thorn in their side. But after about that 60 days after your notice, if you haven't made progress and you decide that you want to continue this collection process, waiting is not going to get you paid. If you haven't been able to shake the money loose on your own by hassling them for 60 days, you need to hire a collection lawyer, a construction lawyer to, to file a lawsuit to collect that debt for you. Be very careful of unsolicited um, requests made upon you from where we see it a lot, collection agencies out of Texas um, that tell you that they'll be able to get you paid, it won't cost you anything, that they have some inside track. We find that uh, all of those, not most of them, all of those uh, unsolicited um, offers to, to pay you uh, to collect your debt are scams. We had a client who was uh, who fell for it, received the unsolicited request. The collection agency uh, out of Texas um, collected the debt and then never reimbursed the money back to uh, our client. Um, we ended up suing them at, in Texas and unfortunately they all filed for bankruptcy. So be very careful about that. Um, unless you have a business reason, you should not delay in collecting your bond claim or lien claim or any other collection uh, efforts that you have. Um, it's not like wine. It doesn't get better with age. It gets much, much harder to collect your debts the older they are. Um, so, Ariella, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Okay, I'm ready. So if we have a direct contract with a contractor that has a bond on the project, the project is on U.S. is on U.S. soil in another country and could not file an NTO due to the location. How can we get paid? Do we still have rights? And I, okay, I actually, so, that's basically, I'm, I'm sure this question could be on federal projects. This might be more federal right. than... Right. So Go I'm I'm going to assume that it's a federal project, right? So you said U.S. soil on another uh, in another country, that typically is governed by the Miller Act, which is the federal lien and bond statute. Um, so uh, the rules are similar, um, and you need to make a claim on that bond. So, for example, we recently had a case where we represented a marine contractor doing work at Guantanamo Bay, right? So that's a foreign country, Cuba, on US soil, uh, Guantanamo Bay. And we made a claim on the contractor's payment bond. Um, and the, again, the process is similar. So it's, you don't need a notice to owner, um, but you may need to serve that notice to, uh, sorry, the notice of non-payment. Um, and you have to file suit within one year. So depending on where you are in that process, um, you have certain very limited time frames. I would suggest that uh, in the next slide, I'll have my email address. Maybe you want to send me an email and I'm happy to give you more details on the Miller Act to make sure that you secure your rights. But again, probably the single most important deadline on a Miller Act claim is to file a lawsuit no later than one year from your last work on that federal project. Any other questions, Ariella? We don't have any other questions. So our next seminar and webinar. Yes, the next one is on October 31st 
and it's boo, scary lien waivers and how to avoid them and still get paid. So October 22nd from 8 to 11, we take a very deep dive uh, talking about liens, bonds, contract uh, uh, rights and provisions, all focusing on how to protect yourself and get paid. Um, We've been doing this now for almost 10 years. We do several uh, every year. This next one is in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, I believe we have almost 50 people signed up, so we're getting close to capacity. So if you want to sign up, you should do so right away. Uh, You go to sunraynotice.com forward slash education. You can see all of the upcoming webinars that we do free every month, as well as the upcoming um, seminars that you can sign up for. Um, so uh, I encourage everybody, if you have any questions that you think of later, feel free to send Ariella uh, or me an email. We'll be happy to answer those questions that you may have. Um, and again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Alex. You did a wonderful job. Have a sunny day, everyone.